All right. Clicking the button. Grabbing my notes. Sliding them to the side. Corley Moore. Firehouse Vigilance. It is weekly scrap number 121. My guest tonight is Isaac Frazier. He is a second generation firefighter with Wichita Fire Department. He works on Rescue Company 1. He has 18 years in the fire service. And before he went to Wichita, he was a captain with St. John's County down in Florida, where he spent a majority of his time on the heavy rescues. He runs tactical advantage training. He is taught all across the country, including FDIC, hot lectures, you name it. He teaches it just last year. And I say last year like it just happened easily. But just last year, he launched into the Job Fireman Symposium. And it's safe to say um, he is into the job. So, Isaac Frazier, welcome to Scrap episode number 121. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's going to be a blast, brother. I'm looking forward to it. It will be. And uh, people are already logging in and chiming in. Chris Crawford said, there's that stash. (laughs) <laughs> Joss Augustine said, yo, I don't know if that's how he says it, but that's how I did it. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. good. It's pretty good. We got a TMBL from Colton Purcell. Yes. Woo son. There it is. Okay. Yes. There absolutely. it is. <laughs> is there anything I missed in the intro? Anything you would like to add? No, it actually made me a lot more exciting than I really am. <laughs> no doubt. No, dude, you've earned every bit of it. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, audience, get your questions ready for Isaac. If you have any questions for him, type them in the chat. I will try to find them and throw them at him. Uh, get primed and ready to go. If you find value in the scrap, go to firehousevigilance.com. Support it because I, the live scrap will never have ads as long as I can uh, help it. So from that, all the intros are done. Isaac, are you ready to kick this off? I'm going to throw the first question at you. I am. I feel like I'm a DJ and a techno. I like it. You got the wiki I'm not wiki. normally a headset wearer. <laughs> I've been asking this question a lot recently, especially when it comes to second generation or legacy firefighters. And I, I really want to know and ask lead off with how much of an impact being a second generation firefighter, how much of an impact did your father have on you in your career choice? Was it always a foregone conclusion or, or kind of what's your story on getting into the fire service and that? Man, that's a, that's a big one. It's kind of like a real big question. So my dad did 40, 42, 43 years in the fire oh, service, wow. retired out as chief a long time. He did, I had 22 with Wichita. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so I I wasn't really an early fireman kid. I, I wasn't, I just wasn't. I had other things, uh, guns and stuff that I like to do. Uh, big wrestler growing up, a lot of stuff going on. And I always liked firearms. That was one of the things that, so cop, military, that was sure. the things that, that, were, that were big in my mind um real early on so military grew up i got terrible hearing that's probably why it's good to have these on um so military was pretty tough um you know got hurt senior year in wrestling it was ranked real high in the state and got hurt and couldn't wrestle anymore so that kind of took a lot a lot away um from me and then but but my whole time as a child like my dad always came home happy he always came i grew up on a farm um the farm i live on now um, it just, he, he always smelled of smoke. Eyes were always sooty, nasty, but he was always happy. And he was a farmer part-time too, owned a dive shop. Like he always worked a lot, Right. but he was always happy. I never heard him complain about it. All the stuff we did, I uh, went to Joyland growing up at the union parties, all these things. I was all, all my friends were fireman's kids. It was kind of a, I don't want to say it was a different time, but like everybody did stuff together. You played softball if you didn't even play softball on the fireman team. Like that, that was just a big thing. So, you know, over the years I saw that, that and I had different ideas of what I wanted to do. Always liked going to the firehouse. Right. Um, it was a decent little drive to the firehouse, but always liked it. The guys always treated me well. And it was, it was always a really good memory, the fire department. But I wasn't, uh, had all the t shirts, had all, you know what I mean? I sure. just wasn't, I wasn't, um, really wired that way he never pushed it on me which i appreciate now i don't push it on my kids i just kind of let them you want to you know be an astronaut or a Olympic swimmer whatever you want to do do it right but when you realize you can work 10 days a month and have the biggest biggest adrenaline rush in the world and love going to work every day they'll start to kind of you know roll that way and i've already seen my oldest he came and helped it into the job this year back at the booth and he doesn't understand you know i travel and teach 15 times a year but he doesn't see that realm of it um and then when he kind of gets to see it he kind of talked about it I already talked about next year you know my youngest is a little more he's been saying he wants to be a fireman forever right but 
it's just you know it, it's it's been a it's been a crazy journey i mean crazy journey we're always real big family you know real family oriented um growing up so i was always around it but i think there's so many i always like with kids we're at the store or something i'll let them get in the fire truck or my captain's that way too i always spend as much time as i can because i remember the first time i went to the firehouse and read the fire truck i remember i remember exactly how they treated me right. exactly what they said to me and i was little um, so I realized that impact, if they would have treated me bad or been rude to me, you know, maybe I wouldn't be where I'm at or doing what I'm doing. So I feel like, I feel like I wasn't really a, a growing up saying, man, I'm going to be a fireman. I'd be a fireman. When I was getting kind of through high school, that's when it started to turn on. And, uh, I kind of realized it was something that, that I really, you know, wanted to do. Right on, right on, man. No, I love the stories, man. I love knowing that motivation and the reasoning and the, and the impact. And I love that, like you said, carrying it forward with you still remember how they treated you and that's beautiful man so uh one of the probably the biggest questions you get is starting over and the move so i want to hear the story of how that came to be um it's not like you just moved a couple hours over or something it's like a few you hopped <laughs> a few states in there yeah it was thousands of miles <laughs> right. it was, it's like the most common i mean you were at the show last year i did a little thing on relationships a short little deal for 15 minutes at a downtime and you know, there was guys tearing up saying they moved to different departments after listening to a podcast I did um, years ago about it. And it's, man, it's humbling to me. It's crazy. And I always, the people ask it all the time. Hey, I work for this department. I work for this department. I want to go to this big city. I want to do this. What do you think I should do? That's not me, man. <laughs> like, I don't, that's your own deal. Right. That's not, you have to make, it took me, I want to say when me and my wife, I start talking about it, it took me about eight years to move. I think was kind of the process. Um, every time I, I wanted to work for which side, I've already started EMT school here prior to my dad, right when I'm graduating high school, I was already in an EMT class and, and senior year. Um, he got a fire chief's job. Uh, and he was a fire chief here in Hutch, Kansas after, after Wichita. And then he got a chief job down in Florida to offer for it. Well, he said, Hey, you want to go? I was just graduating and, you know, I, I mean, I wasn't making any money, little, little side things or working my went and doing all these things, but I wasn't making volume of money to kind of right. sustain myself. Um, all my friends were here. This is what I know. You know, Kansas, I'm a big bow hunter, big hunter. Kansas is dreamy for me in that realm. But I also grew up going to Florida. We went to Florida a couple of times a year. He had a, my dad had a boat down there growing up, you know, in the dive shop. And so I've, I've been diving for a long, long time. So the Florida is appealing too. Um, and I said, well, he said, well, I can get you in fire Academy, you know, Florida state fire Academy, uh, program down there within a week of you getting down there, you can get in fire Academy. Well, yeah, you know, sure. I guess, right. well, yeah, let's go. So I go, um, get in that, get my EMP done, get picked up by St. John's County. Pretty young. I was not even 19 years old. Oh, so wow. I was pretty young and ended up getting, getting hired. And it's, it's maybe it's, it's like six months fire Academy, like four nights four nights a week we did the night class and the weekend so it was a lot of a lot of time florida florida's that way but it just you know i got there but i always wanted to be home my sister's here i've got family here and this is home to me kansas is is my home i wanted to retire here and uh i kind of started i wanted to come back and i tested for engineer and made engineer super young fire engineer and got on squad um 17 and I'm like, well, yeah, that you know, I can't. I got promoted. I'm making more money now. Like, I can't. Sure, committed. Yeah, I'm committed. I'm in. I'm, I'm, I'm in. Now. <laughs> well, it continued. My wife will tell you, like, it kept coming up, and coming up, and coming up, and coming up, and coming up. And it's like, because I knew a, a bunch of firemen here, so I still talk to them and I see stuff. And wished I fired out of work. I'd always see them running fires like every day. And I'm running pins all the time. But when you run running pins, you want to go to fires. You know, I'll trade. I always tell people because I've done a lot of volume, I'll trade, you know, 10 pins for a good, a good first in. And, uh, that's a trade I'm willing to make. Well, you know, over the years, my wife's just like, no, we came up here for my grandmother's funeral and it was like negative 18 blowing her coffee froze when we were going to the funeral, like solid and right. poured out as a chunk. You know, I won't move here. Like this place sucks. I said, okay, you know, well, don't say that. You never know. <laughs> you know, well, fast forward, I kept making promotions like right when they would do a test. I'm like, oh man, and I made a lieutenant. And then you know, I'm like, oh, you know, babe, let's do this. Let's do this. I want to get the kids, you know, Midwest. I love the Midwest. I love the people. I want to get back home. 
and she, you know, then makes charge nurse. And she'd been a nurse for a long time at Mayo Clinic. And well, the time's not right. Well, then they're doing another hiring. And then, you know, I met Captain. And they like it just kept calm right. every time. It's like it's not right. And then um I ended up, you know, you you always talk about a book on the show. Um, one of the things for for me is my wife got me a book um called Wild at Heart, which is probably the biggest mistake she ever, you know, ever did. <laughs> John Eldridge did it and it's a it's a Christian style book I have it right here because I know we were going to talk about books a little bit nice but it's you know it's about walking with God and kind of your path but it talks about you know boys be boys men will be men you know the dream and chasing dreams and striving well I read this thing and I'm like gosh man like I don't want to be stagnant I, I want I want to move and I'm a doer like I have a hard time sitting still like I like to do stuff and uh, I'm like, oh, man, I'm reading this thing and like doing the study journal and trying to do this thing. And finally, you know, I'm a captain and I'm acting as chief and nothing against chief. It's just I'm a younger guy. It's not me. I don't like riding in the car by myself. Like all the things I love about the firehouse like kind of goes away a little bit, you know, I'm by myself. You know, I feel like I'm like talking to myself like, hey, hey I was like, what do you want for lunch today? I don't know. You know, right. what do you want to, you no, know, yeah, like, I feel the, like there should be somebody there. The with lonely me. buggy. Yeah. Yeah. And the buggy's fast. I mean, I get the fires and get there and they're like, why do you have your air pack on? You know, you're Italian <laughs> today. And I'm like, well, I was going to do, you know, my 360, you know, I had to force a fence and take that thing off. You know, it's, right. it's different. It, it, it isn't me. I'm a, I'm a blue, I feel like a blue collar. Maybe I'm just not smart enough to make that much money. <laughs> I don't know, but I just, uh, <laughs> you know, the process just kept coming and coming and then things started happening. And, um, you know, I pretty much thought life short. I told my wife, you know, with the state of economy stuff is going, all these things, I want to be back in the Midwest. And uh, I came up here and taught, which I'll hop for years. Um, the hands on here, when I was in Florida, I came top. They always had me come up and, you know, talking to Chief Snow and the Chiefs here. And, you know, it just, it, it felt right to come back. And, you know, my wife's like, hey, you know, you talked about it. I'm tired of you talking about it. You're either going to do it. The kids are young or we're not. Right. You know, and I'm like, okay. She's like, you know, you act like you have a choice. It's a big city. It's not like you just walk up there and say, hey, I want to get hired. And you, you show up and they say, okay, great. You know, Isaac, your dad worked here. Great. Come on. Right. You know, it's, right. Like it, it doesn't work. Like your son realized in Oklahoma City. Yes. It's not a walk on type place. You know, you, you have to work for it. So got all the testing done and stuff kind of lined out, you know, where I'm driving you know, six hours to go take the test and all these things. Um, it was down in like Sarasota area or Tampa area, get a national fire test done and all these. And then time stuff just kind of played out and end up, you know, coming up interviewing. And, and she's like, it's not a choice. You act like it's a choice. It's not a choice until you get a job offer. That's when you make the decision. You know, you're in your mind to making a decision that's right. not even there. And I'm like, all right, you know, I'll do it. So I go up and, and take it and, you know, it, it was crazy from going running the USAR program down there um, with the task force stuff and all the stuff. I'm getting a big retirement, like all these things. People are like, you're nuts. You know, you are absolutely nuts. Right. And then fast forward, you know, four or five years, I'm not nuts. You know, <laughs> we're averaging working fires all the time and, and just having an absolute ball. And my kids love school and wrestling tournaments and all these things. Like it, it was the best decision that I could make for me and my family. And I just had to make sure it wasn't selfish. Right. Right. I had to make sure that, you know, my wife's a nurse. She can work. She can work at, at anywhere. But the big thing was she could work less and see me and the kids more if I came up here. Because the debt to income ratio, sure, sure. you know, with yeah, and retirement that. there and, and paying stuff off here and, and going no debt and all these things allowed us to live more of a family life than we could live there trying to hustle and, and make money for, for the cost of living and things down there. So, I mean, if you see any of my stuff, my kids kill big deer every year. You know, I kill big deer. Like, it's just turkeys. Like, I was going to say, how much was the hunting? How much did the hunting play into it? Ooh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love some hunting. I, I grew up that way. And, you know, it, it just, I had to make sure that it was, that it was not selfish, you know? I mean, and everything's not about me. And you got to realize that um, with your family that, that they come first. They do. You know, as much as I love the fire department tomorrow, you know, they said, hey, choose your wife and kids or the fire department. I'd be like, you know, what fire department? Like, it, bye. <laughs> you know, it's not anything perfect. It's, that's my life. And um, I think a lot of guys, you know, forget that when they when they right. become firemen. That, 
you know, yeah, no, it's a easy. huge part of my life. Yeah, it's huge. Easy. And, and early on in my career, like I had to challenge that. I, I had a big challenge with that early on because, you know, you get so enveloped in it and it's like, hey, I'm going to, you know, fire department training network for two weeks and then I'm going here and I'm going here and you got to remember they're still here, you know, and that's the teaching realm as an instructor too. You can get sucked into that. I have to play that really, really smart. Yes. Um, cause you know, money and this, this, that type of stuff isn't everything. And that's what I learned moving back is money isn't everything. It's really not. It's just, you know, the quality of life. And it's not that Florida, like St. John's, I still talk to guys and I love those guys. Yes. Like the guys there are great. It's just, I always tell people, I look at myself and it may be a really, really dirty diamond. I mean, just a nasty, you know, black charcoal diamond, but I feel like as a fireman, you're, you're a diamond. Right. Everybody's a diamond in the rough okay. in, early in your career. Nobody comes in and it's, it's just this polished piece. It won't happen. Right. You right. can be a, a welder and maybe you're good with special operations stuff or you're a framer. So it helps with the structural collapse. You have some stuff that, that may be better than others. Or like me, I drag raced for, for eight years. Like I was big in cars, built cars with my dad. I knew cars. So like you look at this dirty diamond, like St. John's. Like we did a lot of classes, a lot of uh, company officer stuff, a lot of things uh, like attic fires. That was our primary thing, lightning strike attic fires on, on big homes. So that type of stuff, like that was polished. Uh, vehicle extrication, we did 100 and I don't remember what, 148 or 137 the last year I left. Like we wow. did high volume, high speed pins, like a lot. Like that was polished. But down there, forcible entry, you just don't force many doors. Like it's not. It's not, the it's not there. Yeah. Um, the volume's not there for the basement fires. The volume, there's no, there's <laughs> right. no basement. Don't exist. Like, right. You know, it doesn't exist. So guys are coming in and it's easy for them to, you know, make sure they're sounding floors and going. That's my hardest thing because I've never had to sound floors before. <laughs> there was never anything underneath me. Right. And it was sand and, and, you know, block. So, you know, you look at these things. I felt like I was polished on multiple things. And, but I had this whole other portion of the diamond that, that was just, Still rough. You know, yeah. Super rough. And rough would be an understatement. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I've got all these polished and, and everybody in their mind says, oh, I can go be, and I'm not saying a big city fireman, but it is, there's volume there. Yeah. I can be a big city fireman. Oh, I could, I could be on a rescue there. I could be on a truck there. I could, do, I could do what they're doing. I could do that. I could do that. Well, maybe it could, maybe it couldn't, but you'll never know. And uh, Rick George, he's Palm Beach County retired. Like, I talked to maybe five or six guys I really respected over the years that were close to retirement or not, or had left Scott Shaw, who's teaching this year um, from Cincy. He was a battalion chief in Kentucky and left and gave it all up to go to Cincinnati. And he was on a rescue company there. Um, you, you know what I mean? Just guys yeah. that, that had done similar things. Uh, Brian Brush, there was guys that had done and like I respected and guys that were at retirement. So my dad, he's at retirement level. He's like, you're giving up retirement to go, what? Like you're, you're ridiculous. Because he's at that point, sure. You know that's his perspective. But he also fought fire for Wichita for 22 years. You know, so he doesn't. He couldn't compute. Like he couldn't compute it. He'd done that volume, and it was like, you know, I, I just, I just had, I had to know. Like that was my big thing on itself. I had to know. Could I do it? Could I not? Right. And uh, so finally, I made that decision. Said, Let, let's give this a shot. Uh, we prayed about it a bunch. Read books, like all these things. And it just started pushing that way. Like it just started pushing that way and pushing that way. And uh, I did it. And, you know, now I feel like, I mean, I probably forced more doors on, on squad two the first year than in months than I forced in Florida in 15 years. Right. Gu on. I guarantee it. Right. And it's just a different type of you know, your normal frame that, construction. That other facet. Yeah. yeah it starts it's, it's a totally different thing. So, you know, or basement fire, all these things, or true truck work, or, you know, it's just, it's different. It's very different. Not not that one's better than the other. They both have given me a lot. Right. I mean, it, St. John's gave me more volume and pins that I could have, that I could pray for. I mean, it, it just, it's, but what it did is come here. We just had a double fatal bad one um, last week and it, but I can see that, you know, I've had the volume. I can look at these things and all, all these, those calls are all, they're kind of a fluid thing, you know, with extrication, you have to look at it and see it's not a book. Right. It, it isn't right. a book there, it, That isn't how it works. There's no ABC. It doesn't look like this in the book. It doesn't look like this. Yeah. The door pop would be great. If the door was even not flat compression, the A was touching the B that sounds great. You right. know, or the dash went at an upward angle, but they got crushed from the seat in the frame of the floor pan. 
that's not in the books. You know, it's just that high volume you have to have. Absolutely. And um, hey, I want to dig that. into it. I want to dig into the extrication and, and pick your yeah, brain absolutely. on it. Believe me. But I also yeah. want to I want to throw these at you before they scroll away yeah, because sure. J.D. Ducharme wants to know, first off, right out the gate, what bourbon are you drinking? Oh, that's E.H. Taylor. <laughs> that's a single barrel that he uh, gave me at the show. Oh, okay. There I got go. from him at the show. And then Tim Cron said right afterwards, yeah. are we going to talk about fireman shit or bourbon? And so <laughs> I don't know why people think I'm into bourbon. I don't get it. I don't understand. No, I, yeah, no. Old Tim Cron's up Kentucky man. He's up in that area. So absolutely. Uh, I'm still Buffalo Grace. So I had to get those two in there before they scrolled yeah, away. Yeah. And people are, are talking highly of you. Isaac Frazier is the man, <laughs> offers great classes, great classes, highly recommended, one of the best in the business. That comes from Marshall, Marshall Mirachi the third. Um <clears throat> Moving takes balls, brother. That comes from Dirk Janiak. Uh, and then a lot of people said, love Wild at Heart. Wild at Heart was a huge book for me as well. Um, yes, that's from uh, Nathaniel Winans and JD again chiming in. Okay, so. Appreciate it. That stash, David Mellon chiming in, Kansas guy saying, <laughs> that stash though. Uh, all right, here we go. How do you handle being a backstep firefighter again with so much experience from outside Wichita? How do the guys in your department receive it? Man, it's a totally different I thing. This I want to say a, that. This, I want yeah, to include yeah. that's from Ryan Stedham. I just wanted to get that in. Okay. There. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, um, totally different thing. So I tell people the recruit part, I actually enjoyed. I, I'm like early, early on, um, I got assigned to ones, which is Special Operations Battalion. Um, went to Engine One <clears throat> downtown. And it, like the cleaning, for example, guys be like, how you clean it? Like you went from a captain acting chief all the time to, to mop and floors every day? Like what's the, but what they don't understand is that's a firehouse that my dad was a lieutenant in. The same firehouse that my dad was a lieutenant in. So I'm mopping the floors, you know, in his quarters 20 years ago. Right. You know, the the legacy part of it, and I'm weird about stuff like that, the history stuff I'm, I'm weird about, but that's not hard to me. And I always tell people like, coming from somewhere else gave me a playbook I know what I should be doing. I had multiple recruits, you know, that I took care of early on. So I had like the recipe book already. I knew right and wrong. Um, my biggest worry was, you know, that I would see something on a pen. I was always that, that I could have an effect on that I wasn't going to be allowed to do. Right. You know, and, and that didn't that didn't play. The officers were always really good. The firemen were really good, and there was some hard times. Not everybody's going to receive you well. I mean, you know that it is not all birthday cakes. Like, you know, a, a guy that's got a couple of years on and you come in and, and you're brand new and, and you know the captain because he worked with your dad. You know, my dad was a battalion chief 15 years ago or 20 years ago, and he knows me since a kid. That isn't always received very well. Sure. So that, that was hard sometimes. Um, the good part, what was really easy is these guys, and I say the firemen and the officers, are very, very vetted, very good at what they do, right? So when I come in, it's not like in my mind I'm thinking, oh, well, I've been to more basement fires than that guy has. Or I've been to more balloons than that guy. That, that never crossed my mind for a second because it's not accurate. Right. Um, you know, they these these officers, and that's a different with sometimes a big city is, and knowing this city, these guys have been to fires. And I'm talking a ton of fires. So when you got an officer even being new and having a bunch of experience, it's not some of it's applicable, um, the street smarty stuff, but some of it's not, you know, some of that stuff, the force plenty, it's easy for me to lead, listen to Mark Meshack or one of the guys, you know, captain number three, five on how to force doors. Cause he's done it a bunch, you know, and I don't have the same. And when I talk force and doors, it's like, you know, you got a, a, a board up or you're doing this or like we had one, I don't know, case that I helped enforce and it had, um, it was like four 22 inch rims stacked on end with four buys screwed in the floor that was their buffer in the rear for the rear door that's something you don't get right. like unless you're in that urban zone i mean that, that's all there is to it so i i didn't have that like the residential wood frame door cool no problem you know you, you make a mistake on that and, and it still opens right that one is fortified with three deadbolts it's a different story or you get in a more complicated locks or you know everything's screwed in like it's just a different a different realm but it was easy for me to listen to these these officers and, and to listen to other firemen because their experience and volume spoke for themselves, you know, and, and, and you have to come in and say, Hey, 
I'm starting fresh. These are the, these are in my mind. These are the facets that I need polished. This is like, I'm learning. And I learned from awesome recruit Academy instructors, uh, Keith Neiman and a bunch of the guys that were down there, uh, different ball and all these guys that were down there, Ryan Armstrong, they were all down there and they had volume. Right. So, you know, we're stretching every day different than I stretched, you know, in the past. And it's like, they are engine company guys. And we bring in truck company guys, the rescue company guys. And it was just like, we probably stretched thousands of times. I mean, thousands. And you're just like, whoa, you know, where I come from a place it's like, hey, get your gear on, cool. Well, now we're getting gear on in under 30 seconds, fully masked, everything. You know, and it's just a different speed. It's a totally different, you know, hey, don't don't trot on the fire ground. And that, not, not on my end, like we, we move. Like, right. you, like we don't post helmet cams and stuff. I have them, but we don't post them. But we move like the core of the city. They don't play around. Like if you're, if you make a wrong turn on your streets, you're third due. Like in your first year, like it's a full speed, like very calculated, aggressive search, aggressive fire attack. Like it's, it's just, it's nice because it's been there. Yeah. You know, we went paid in 1886 in Wichita. So it has a history you know, that a lot of departments don't have to where, like, I like that stuff. I geek on that stuff. So it, it it's easy and hard. Like I said, there was hard times to where some people just won't accept you. Right. Hey, you know, you don't, you're not a captain here. Cool, man. I didn't say that I was, you know, <laughs> and I always joke and say, you know, I'm a junior private first class, junior private, you know, and I always make these jokes. I'm a jokester anyways. So you have to realize anywhere you go, Anything you do, you're going to have, I'm sure you get stuff for, for doing, you know, this podcast. Well, why does he need to do that podcast? Why is he better than somebody else? Like, is he trying to get attention? You're going to get that no matter what, period. If you, if you don't want any controversy, don't do anything. Right on. That's, that's as straight as it gets. You don't think the show got some, got some controversy? You know, why, why, why did this or why, you know, that's just. Oh. People have a problem with me. Like that's their problem, not mine. Right. Like as long as I'm doing stuff from the heart and doing, doing what I think's right. And I, I tell that to everybody. That's, that's how you should be. Now don't be wronging people and then say, well, you know, that they're just after me. Well, maybe you suck. Right. Maybe you're not doing very good. Maybe you are pretty, pretty pissed poor. It's not, that's not a a cover all, but as long as you're coming from the heart, you know, starts in the mirror. And as long as that's true, it is look in the mirror, right on Look in the mirror, right on. Um, beautiful. I'm going here. A lot of questions. Uh, some of them we're going to cover. I want to get this one. Colton Purcell wanted to know, and you kind of touched on it already a little bit, but I'm going to still throw yeah. it at you. Coming from second generation fire family as well. How did you feel going to the same city as your dad? Was it difficult? And did you feel lots of pressure to meet the standards slash legacy of your father? Yes and no. So that's, a, that's a, this one's a pretty cut and dry. I did. Because a lot of the high, I did, but I didn't. And the reason is because I came later, right? My dad had been retired for a period. Like all the big chiefs all worked for my dad at some point. Like a lot of them did, or some of the guys. But I came, you know, I went and made my own my own way for 15 years somewhere else. Right. You know, on the teaching circuit, all these things, I kind of made my own way. So then when I came back, I didn't feel like it was a coattail ride type of thing. Um I didn't, I never really felt that way at all, but on the flip side, yeah, I, I want to, you know, I, I want to do a good job for, for my dad's name. And not only for that, you know, a lot of people go, well, you know, you're, you're making a name for your dad. I'm making a name for my kids. Yeah. Like that, that was one reason for coming back. If either one of them, you know, in God's grace wants to be a fireman, I want to be a fireman in Wichita period. Like that, that, that was my thing. And I want to give them that option. If they're in Florida, they're not coming back here. Right. I'll never get to experience this once they're settled. Um, you know, my youngest is 13 and he is 13. Like I want to have that. If they want to be a third generation fireman here, great. And Wichita is big on that. Unlike a lot of places, right. you know, our recruit academies, there's four five, six guys, um, you know, that are legacy firemen that, that are coming from their dads or uncles or guys that work here. That's big in, in Wichita, which says a lot about the department. That's huge. To me, like if it wasn't any good, then they wouldn't be, you know, following footsteps. They'd say, oh, you know, my dad hated it here or, or something of that nature. So yes and no. I, I want to do good for my dad and do good for my name, but I really want to 
like give that for my kids that if they want to come here, they're coming into something where, you know, hey, I knew your dad. And the crazy part for me is here kind of starting over where I could have retired super young there. Like I could be on the job with my kids, either one of them, like right. in five years. Right. To me, that's <laughs> like, yeah, like I'll be like, hey, guys, you know, chief. I never asked you for a favor, but if you put my boys at the slowest companies in the city, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just keep them safe. Right. Don't, don't see the stuff that I do. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But I uh, hope that explains that. No, I actually, I, beautiful answer, man. Beautiful answer. Um, I want to throw this at you, which is, have you always, this is my question coming at you. Have you always been a teacher or is it something that grew from your passion uh, from rescue and, and heavy rescue work or how did it come about? How did you, how'd you get to teaching? I think it started with, um, with wrestling. So, you know, wrestled my whole life. Uh, and then when I moved down to Florida with assistant coach down there for, for a couple of years and Florida's not a big wrestling state with assistant coach for a year down there. And I think just that kind of the teaching, teaching of wrestling and kind of enjoying doing that, enjoying working with the kids and then when I got on the job, I had a couple good officers early on, um, Sherman Missick and a couple, and they're still down there. Um, and they kind of, Chief Sneed, they gave me a lot of leeway. They knew that I liked this stuff. You know, I'm a big book reader. I've got a huge, huge, you know, library of books over here that my wife would uh, get rid of about 400 of them. Right. Because um, I've got her whole side taken. But, like, I'm a big reader. I like, I like understand what i'm doing like the whys of what i do so early on i would do like a you know a thing on vertical vent i'd read you know say a, one, you know one of the trade books and read on it and i'd do like the officer would give me say hey do a powerpoint on it for the crew even though i didn't have much time on and they knew that and it was the information sharing right you, you were know, early on i started to do and early on in my career like i had a chief uh, bobby hall that let me travel and Chief Shank let me travel early on, like a couple of years on, they started sending us places. And what I learned was everybody goes, well, my chief won't send me anywhere. What I learned was that if I wrote, you know, a four or five page, you know, write up on why I needed to go, and the guys I was going with needed to go, then they'd allow us to go and they'd pay for it because Beautiful. they saw the return for the department. <laughs> so, I mean, it takes work. You have to, you have to work to get that done because nobody wants to write the write, sure. the write up. But they'd let me go. So we started traveling to California and North Carolina and Virginia and all these places to go to classes. So I got to see a lot of instructors early on. And then just there, I started kind of, once I started making officer, and, you know, we just started training a lot. Well, those training training elements started turning into little drills. And then we started doing battalion drills. And they just continually turned into more and more where I started teaching extrication, you know, down there. And then, you know, it just kind of starts piling. And guys go, hey. You know, this is awesome. I heard you did this class. Like, can we come? And then it started going to local, and I teach a little local. And I got in a couple shows, and and I we traveled for like probably I don't know six or seven years going to classes. And a lot of them, I'm like, man, they don't do a millimeter of the volume that we do. Like a lot of the stuff that they're showing, some of it's great, and I'm picking stuff up, but a lot of the stuff's not like really accurate. Um, you know, and I was like, and then I think I was talking to my dad. He's like, oh, you think you could do better? Do it yourself. Right. You want to teach? Go that teach challenge, something. You, yeah. think, you think you got it? And being stubborn, not me. I'm saying a kind of stubborn. sure. Yeah, like, you're, not oh, okay, you're not stubborn. You're not stubborn at all. Right. You know, I will. I will. I'll, I'll go do that. And he's like, it'll be short lived. You know, teach it short lived. You'll get to teach for a little while, and then it, you burn out. And it's over. Okay. And you know, now I'm ten years plus teaching nationally, and uh, having a ball. So yeah, I think I think the teaching thing. I just kind of slowly fell into it and, and just turned it in, I guess, to something. It was obviously from scratch. It was, it was big time from scratch, but, um, you know, I don't, it was kind of early on in the social media thing. And uh, me and a uh, buddy, Chris Knapp, were doing first two questions and putting up scenarios and I was Photoshopping them. Cause I did a little in college, a little computer stuff. I was Photoshopping and taking fire trucks out and taking hose lines out and doing like size ups right. early on in that. I think we were the first ones. And uh, so start posting that up, post that up. And people, it was crazy. You guys from Miami are saying how they would fight the fire, you know, and all of this stuff. And then it kind of kind of started the network a little bit. And then started networking a little bit and just started teaching. I guess I just kind of fell into it, I guess. And I'm Beautiful. a talker. I mean, I'm a no, talker, no, so I don't, I don't mind, I don't mind uh, talking and kind of giving, giving information. I feel like what we were teaching was a little different 
a little different style. And all of that plays together. I mean, you you yeah. you you're a storyteller, you're entertaining, you're energetic, and you're knowledgeable, and you're curious enough to go figure out the real answer. You know, to do yeah. to do yeah. the work and the research, and all of that comes together at this focal point of well, ten years later. Yeah, yeah, beautiful man. Um, wow. Some of the biggest lessons that you have learned over the years, especially when it comes to teaching. Oh my gosh. Biggest lessons over the years. Um, and you can go we anywhere. Talked about, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And we, we talked about we talked about the show a little bit um, when I did that thing about relationships. Everything in this in this gig is relationships. I truly believe that. Uh, we talked about it at the show, you know, and, and you were there. It's it's just a like early on in your career. It's like you got your crew and you got friends. Right. I don't care if that guy didn't like me. I don't care if that guy didn't like me. You know, I'm better than him. You know that early like arrogance of, of a younger person. Young, yeah, the youth. You <laughs> don't know what you don't know. Right. Um, what I learned early on is that, like, I'm a jokester, and I still am a bad jokester. Like, prankster kind of, I've, I've tried to tone it back over the years as I get older, um, but I like to have fun. No matter, and any guy will tell you, at work, I like to have fun. Right. I don't really feel like I have down days unless I'm sick or something. Like, I want to have fun. And what I've learned over the years is, like we're on borrowed time. And when I say borrowed time, it's life in general. But I've seen like my dad go through the phases of promotion. I've seen him, you know, as a chief. And I've seen the different levels of thinking what I want to do and what I don't want to do. But when you retire, besides like those relationships you built in your job, it's over. And a lot of retirees have a hard time with it. I know my dad kind of, he wouldn't say anything about it. But you go from being something for years, you know, you're driving down the street and the civilians are waving at you and the kids, all these things. And you go from that to like, you're the same, like you just walk into Home Depot and nobody know you. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. How, and my dad told me, nobody cares how many fires you go to when I was looking at moving back. Right. We had that guy had a conversation with Ryan Cummings from Casey Mo this morning on the way home from shift. Uh, and the pumper got thumped last night. I think we went out three, they went out seven and we just got thumped. And it was like, you know, why do we do this, Ryan? Like, like, wh why, why do we have to be busy? Why do we chase that, that volume in the busiest companies in the city? Like, that's what you want. When, if you think about it, your, your call per dollar value is not good at busy companies. Right. You know, my dad's had double knee surgeries, double shoulder surgeries, you know, all these things. Uh, Dow, one of my best friends on the job um, in Wichita is still out with, with neck surgery um, from sheetrock dropping on my fire, like all these things. Like, why do we do that? Like when you could go to a slower company, you know, extend your career. And when you get done, like how many years you cut off your life being in a company like that with no sleep and just getting thumped, um, you know, the danger, the fires, all those things. So you, you look at these things and, and I just realized over the years when I was talking around this morning, that's just how we're wired. Right. It isn't. And I told my dad, I don't care if people know, like when I'm old, you know, you know how many fires I went to because they won't care. You know, when you're gone, you're gone. Like when you're off the job, you're off the job. But like Rick George told me before that move, um, I didn't finish at Merler. Like he said, when you're sitting there and you're 90 years old, and this is just the version that I remember. This is years ago. Sure. You know, you're sitting in that that nursing home bed. Your wife might still be alive, she may not. Your kids have moved away, whatever. And you're by yourself sitting in that nursing home bed. And you're sitting there with your legs hanging over with your floppy socks, you know, curled up on your toes. You're either going to say, I went and I did what I needed to do, what I felt I was passionate about to do in my time. Or you're going to have some regret and say, well, I could have. I could have. I could have been, you know, a big city farmer. I could have done this. I could have done that. I really could have. But you didn't. You know, and he said in that in that time period, you look at these things, you go, you know, we're on borrowed time, extremely borrowed time. Like we, I'm a big picture taker. You guys are, oh, you take pictures of crews all the time. It's because I've had guys that have been on previous crews that have passed away. And that, you know, that early on, we didn't take a bunch of pictures. You no, know, my crew, I don't have those anymore. Like my dad, I've got like two pictures of him from when he was on the job in 22 years. Yeah. Like they didn't take them. No, it's an epidemic. You know? No, it's a, it, yeah. It, it's crazy. And guys like, oh yeah, you know, it's, it's social media. It's a, I love the guys I work with. It, the, the crew that I'm with right now is probably the best crew I've ever worked with in my career at, at any point. 
they are, and I'm not just saying that because I want Captain to keep me permanent or, you know what I'm, right. I'm saying? It just is. They, they don't, the guys don't talk bad about people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm like least tenured guy and, you know, they all have 13, 14, 15, 17, 18 years on. They all have a lot of time on and they're good people. They, they, they treat each other well. Like we have good relationships. They're, they're family people. They treat their wives good. Like it's just, it's just a good, like when we're at a fire and, and, you know, a guy's standing there and there's fire blowing behind us and I stick my finger in his, in his SCBA hole, you know, and he chokes and we're laughing. Like people, some people look at that and they go, you guys are nuts. <laughs> like you're nuts. But th- these guys have been there so many times. There's so much experience there. I'm so comfortable with those guys that they're so good at what they do and, buy, and they never tell you. Like my senior private, Matt Angel, he'd never say anything. Doesn't even have social media. He'd never say anything about, oh, I've done, you know, 500 fires or I've done. He'd never say that. He's one of the best dudes on the planet. Like he's a good, good fireman. He'd never tell you. Right. But I, I try to, and he's up, he, you know, he's up for promotion. He's on the list. And selfishly, I don't want him to make it. <laughs> and I told him that at a fire two days ago. I said, man, I'm, I'm not trying to be rude, man. I don't want you to make it. Right. I, I want, I want as much time with you as I can. But, you know, I know that these crews and companies, they're borrowed time. Every shift, I try to have as much fun as I can and, and just do as much mm-hmm. as my crew as I can because it's borrowed time with your crew. You're borrowed time on the job. You ask anybody that's at retirement, what do they say? They never said, man, it was sure slow. That, that career took so long. It's, it goes so fast. And everybody's got people that aren't there anymore. Everybody's got guys that have passed on or things that have happened. Like, I just want to enjoy it. That's all. I don't, I'm not a fear monger. I don't live in that realm. Like I want to live. I want to do like, and I'm not saying go crazy. And I go to, you know, you know, <laughs> do, do stupid stuff. And sometimes I do, but it's easy to be aggressive and really push and do those things. When you know that volume of people is around you, that experience level, like, you know, engine two, truck two, like our uh, truck one, our companies around us are, all four companies that are very good at what they do. Like if I, if something happens to me, I have no question that those guys are coming and you know, it lets you to do things that you normally wouldn't do. Sure. And I don't even know how many rescues there were in Wichita last year. We were part of one, uh, me and Brandon, remember I'm with now, um, when like the speed that we do things will push further than we, than, than I, a lot of people are comfortable with. And my wife knows that too. I mean, she knows, like I've made that decision in the past. Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants anything to happen, but I will do everything in my power. That's how I live with myself. Right. You know, and, and see double fatals or we had a blue last night with kids screaming and their dad passed. like all these things. We do the best that we can do. And in that moment, if you're prepared for that, the best that you can be, I feel like it always sits easier. You know, it, it, it always sits easier. Um, to mentally be prepared to see the things that, that we see. Well, and, and regret and, and confidence both start in the same place and that's in your preparation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So if you weren't yeah. prepared, you're going to live with that regret of everything you're talking about, man. And that's, yeah. you know, and what you're talking about is the, is the confidence to live in the moment because you've done the reps, the preps, yeah. the volume. Uh, yeah. That's beautiful, man. Um, okay. Let me see if I missed anything here. Cause I was, I was really enjoying the, uh, <laughs> I went on a tangent. I apologize. No, no, it's beautiful, man. I, the, the The scrap is all about tangents, rabbit holes, and tirades. I mean, <laughs> it makes it's a. Uh, don't let anyone around your bourbon. Hope you're well, brother man. Laugh out loud. That comes from Stuart Fireball, which is yeah, a great, I know that guy. Great name. Um, it's all about the courage to follow the calling that has been placed on your life. Yes, absolutely. That's from George Robertson. Things are scrolling by. I'm just trying to catch some of the better ones. Okay. I want to talk. I want to switch gears and talk to you about Into yep. the Job, man. You got the hat on. Into the Job. I do. Where did it come from and how 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 quickly it came together and how easy it was for you? And that's, that's, <laughs> easy. Uh, easy that's does sarcasm. Not fall. Easy does not fall in. <laughs> um, so we travel. I've traveled. I mean, to Portland, FDIC, done all, a bunch of shows. And there's some beautiful shows out there. I traveled around. Um, did a lot of, a lot is for charity, a lot of for other things. Uh, Cody Trestrail, uh, with Brothers in Battle up in Portland, the fireman's fight taught up there a couple of years ago. And it was like 600 people. One of the funnest 
speaking event that I've done. And then we did hands on with expectation after that. So Cody was a big one that I talked to. I just kind of started looking around and, and did these shows for like 10 years. And I'm like, man, I, I feel like something's missing. I feel like, you know, there's, there's a group of instructors. There, there's a, um, kind of a piece of the puzzle that's missing. And I kind of want, I want to do something with that. And I was talking to my dad about it. And another thing he goes, well, you think you could do a show, do one yourself. <laughs> right. Same, same premise same. of teaching. And it turned out good the first time, you know, kind of, kind of bucking him and going against, against the norm. Um, so I was like, I talked to my wife about it. And I said, Hey, I think, I think, you know, the Midwest, I'd like to do something in the Midwest. Wichita hot is in September. Wichita hot's awesome. Hands on. I talked to a couple of the chiefs and said, Hey, I'm not going to do any hands on at all. I, I don't want, I feel like there's so much to learn from listening to speakers that's not being tapped. I think there's a ton to learn. Um, and it's a lot, a lot of times it's hard for guys to travel and bring gear and fly from other places. I said, I, I kind of want to tap the national and just see if we can do something speaking, um, just, to, just something with speaking. I, I, I wanted that because I love to lecture. That's one of my, I do majority hands on, but I love to lecture. And I feel like I learn a lot listening to people. I just can relate and I can have more, not one on one, but you know what I mean? It's a little more personable. And so he's like, well, do it. You know, I think you can do it. Oh, you know, I will. So I talked to a couple of chiefs and said, hey, this is something I'm looking to do. Talked to a couple of firemen and, and kind of, you know, played it off to see how it could work. And it was right pre-COVID. I mean, it was like the worst possible time to do a huge scale event, in, period. So, but another thing I wanted to do was I wanted to lay it out where, you know, instructors get paid well. I wanted them to get paid, get paid well. And guys are like, well, you know, for an hour, that's a, that's a lot of money. But I understand because I teach in volume. If they teach for one day and they attend the second day event, they're gone four days. Yeah. Right? They've got the, the t- day of travel both ways if they're flying. Right. Uh, they're there. They're away from their family four days. They're paying for a ship trade or getting a ship trade. They're, you know, lodging their dog somewhere. Their kids, you know, have to have a babysitter. There's a lot of things in the teaching realm that people don't understand. Oh, absolutely. Tell you're parking at the airports like $60. You know, I mean, it just adds up. And 99% of the instructors that I, that I talked to and started really searching around didn't want any money. You know, no, 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 it's too much. But is it? Like, how much should you spend on your own leather helmet? How much should you spend going to classes on your, your own or your leather boots before people bought them? Or all these things that you've done to get to where you could be at the level to teach at a show like this. Right. And that, that's what I wanted to do. Pick high volume guys that I'd met over the years, that relationship thing I talked about, guys that like that I built relationships and seen and known and, and related with. I wanted to take these guys that had a lot of time that were urban, you know, a lot of big city departments, um, that have high fire volume, they kind of had something to give, but they were humble. They didn't, you know, they were there was guys throughout the teaching realm. It's just like a fire department. They treat you like crap. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, do you really even go to that many pins or do you even, you know, and then and early on, and then after you teach there a long time that, you know, they totally changed ten. which I have, a, I'm not a grudge holder, but I tend to be a grudge holder a little bit, you know, <laughs> and that, that same thing with like the sponsor stuff, the sponsors can't pay money. People don't understand that. And the sponsors don't understand that because they, you know, most shows they have to pay money. So they can't pay money and they just give product for us to give to the fireman for free. There's no paying for the raffle. It's in your ticket for the show. And once they realized that, the, the, you know, we had 40 or 50 sponsors this year, they loved it. But I also remember the sponsors that treated me not very good early on and said, well, you've only taught 10 classes. You know, we're not giving you a jacket. You're not there yet, you know, boy. Or, you know, and I'm like, you don't have to say it like that, you know, and then now in your, Years later, we're teaching a big show and they're emailing wanting to be part of it. Now, maybe they will be, maybe they won't be, you know, but the show, the show in general came from kind of my search of um, what I wanted to put together that, that I thought would work. You know, there's the alcohol at the event. That's different. That's not a normal thing where you can drink beer and, and watch an instructor. And the other thing is you hear all 11 of them over two days. They're an hour and some apiece. Well, through teaching over the years, that hour hour and 15 it's just from watching people when they start to look at their phone or they start to like not like college related or thinking but visibly i see people lose focus i don't Disengage. care who it is right Disengage. i don't care who it is i'll be watching a keynote from somebody and it's like 
the best speech ever in an hour and 15, they're done. Five or two hours, an hour and 15, we'll do 11 instructors, you know, on what they're passionate about. No real like leadership stuff, um, just firemen, like gritty. You're up there with a the beer speaking. If you like, I mean, and I ask people that, well, they're like, well, you can have a beer there. Yeah, but like at a football game, you enjoy to have a beer when you watch football. Why can't you have a beer responsibly? And we had zero problems. Right. You know, 800 fucking a sold out event without and didn't have a single problem. Nobody yelled, nobody acted up, no fights. Like, and Cody, you know, you could drink a third too. And it's like, you know, it was a blast. It, it was a good time. And a lot of people kind of let loose and have fun. And I just, I had this group. I feel like nationally there's a lot of instructors out there, but there's a lot of guys that don't have a voice either that are very, very good at what they do. A lot of time you're, you're, you know, real urban that get it, they don't teach. And it's like, man, I really want to hear that. And I would do that. Like FDIC, I'd be having a drink with Terry Lawrence and my buddy from Philly or, you know, these guys that I'd be listening to a guy that I'd never heard of before. And his, his message was insane. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, hey, if I ever do anything, can I call you? You know, right. I, like, I want to hear you. And and that's kind of where it turned from. And not use the same instructors. We won't, don't use the same instructors again. They change every year. You know, the cities change every year. So it kind of like, Let's, in the research portion of it, I had a list of probably 50 instructors and I called guys from their departments and broke it down. There was a lot that went in to the instructor list, like an insane amount. And some of them I talked to and it'd be like, hey, you know, yeah, I don't believe in nothing but kicking doors. And they had a ton of fire volume and I'm like, well, what's the message there? Right. You know, there's a there's a difference of being ghetto and, and, and old school and being uneducated and just not, there's no change there. Sure. Yeah. Well, how many times you blown your knee out? Oh, like six times on fires. <laughs> That's not really the message that, that I'm trying to put out there. When you can see a guy, you know, from whatever truck to use a bar and he's ridiculous. And you're like, oh, it's like magic. Like, oh my gosh. Like, wow. You know, there's other stuff out there. So, you know, it's just something I wanted to where, you know, a departments could come and we saw that. Like we got guys from St. Louis and, and Atlanta I mean, captains and stuff like Chip, who's teaching there this year, was there last year. Guys coming from all over the country, from big urban places that have a ton of volume, to come listen to these other guys that have a ton of volume. You know, and I feel like the, it's kind of ego -y. It sucks. But I feel like sometimes you got guys that are like, well, you know, this guy, John Guggenheimer, doesn't go to as many fires as I do, so he doesn't. He, and I'm not saying that. But this just kind of wiped that out. You know, you can't say, go, oh, yeah, for off wrestler, I've been to more fires. I've got five years on the job. I've been to more fires than he has. Probably not. Right. <laughs> you know, probably not. Right. So it takes that general fireman ego that we see a lot and kind of squashes it. It cuts that edge of it off. And I feel like it, it, it let people open up a little more. And it was, I mean, we did over 12,000 emails last year or the last year and a half to two years with COVID coming. I mean, it was so much time invested but up there and, and you even probably saw like i was getting teary-eyed because it all came to like all that time and you got to think 11 instructors it's an hour talking to them a piece just to get them to commit to do it yeah well, then the updates and then how, how long do you think and i'm the only one that does it so i talked to over 55 vendors 50 some vendors well they're they don't want to give you stuff like unless you talk to them and tell them the story so you're looking i mean thousands of hours of doing this stuff and then it just came to a head brian emmenecker he's like this is my last show i'll ever do right and he starts tearing up and i'm like oh and they're like no don't do this like it was just the moment was, was that was powerful dude emmenecker's especially was powerful i mean oh man dude. yeah i mean my wife will tell you like and you're going out at night and you're spending time with people and we're coming in at three in the morning and getting up at 4 30 to go back to the show like it was so high speed but i wanted to enjoy every minute of it if there's a guy from Texas, I want to meet him. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to try to meet all 800 people. And my wife's like, hey, I'll see you when the bar night's over. Because I would just bounce from person to person trying to, to, to kind of hear their story. And some of the stories were incredible. There was a guy that even said I almost committed suicide, you know, and, and I got to this show and it's changed my life. Just weird stuff like that. You know, did God put him in that place at that moment? It'd be weird for me to think not. Right. Um, you know, and it just like life changing from then he ends up winning like a leather helmet, like out of 800 people like this crazy stuff. You know, you look at um, and it just I don't know. It's just the relationship that the moment being there and, and my wife will tell you, I'm so exhausted. 
when we were going back to second, I didn't even have the same shoes on. <laughs> she had to drive my truck back from my house because I had two different shoes on and fell asleep, like walking to the car. Like it was so ridiculous, but it was the funnest fire like event that I've ever been a part of. And not just because it's mine, it's just like the instructors made it, but just the venue, Mike and Tina at that venue. Um, and he actually, we just responded to him three districts over. I was right on the pumper driving the pumper and we were finding had a heart attack the other day. Oh, wow. And, and like, what's the chance that I'm there on a, on a city of 450 plus guys, you know, that it was nuts, you know, just stuff like that. And, and I just like the people that came and I said that in the relationship part, the people that came to the show, I knew hundreds of them from teaching classes nationally or knowing these people, I could look out there and point and name people up and I'm terrible with names, but those relationships are so important and people, people don't get that. I think a lot of times, you know, take the ego crap off, take the, and I'm not saying being confident. I'm confident in what I do. Um, but you ain't gotta be an ass, you know, and, and there's guys that are just, that are just that way. And, and I'm not going to be, and like I said, if they got a problem with me, that's their problem. Not mine. I'm going know. home to a family that I love and go sit in a hot tub and go bow hunting, you know, go <laughs> wake surfing all summer. Like I, I've got, uh, you ain't got to worry about me. Love it, man. Uh, how excited are you for the next end of the job into the job too? And more importantly, what lessons did you learn over the last, the COVID delayed, uh, into the job one plus everything that went on there, man. Like, Go ahead. What was the first question again? <laughs> it, how excited? Man, how excited are you for the next one? First off, I'm ridiculously excited because the word of mouth has taken taken like storm with this thing. Um, the exciting part to me is I wanted to do it all like a viral type thing with no pay. I haven't paid you know through tactical advanced training or any. I've never paid a penny in marketing. Nice. So that, that to me relates to the relationships you build over time. And like, you know, the, the ad that was not an ad, but the flyer we put out, you know, Hey, you share that thing. We're giving away a free ticket to the show. You know, you buy a hat up to January 10th or a stick, even a dollar sticker, you got a chance to win a ticket to the show. You know, we've just done stuff like that. Um, we did some giveaways last year with a pig, um, you know, leading up to the show and we'll do that kind of as it goes on, but it's like, you know, these guys that, that I that I know that have done shows like, man, we spent like thirty five hundred in marketing. And I'm like, I'm not gonna do that. You right. know, I, I want to make a show that I would want to go to and that I would have a blast at. That right. that was my thing. I want something that firemen can come and say, Man, I built relationships at the social event. It was just organic, like it was something that there was something going on there that I haven't experienced. Like, like that, that's what, what I wanted. Now the instructors make that, you know, the venue, I felt like it made that, like the guys that were there traveling, you know, JD and all these guys coming in a camper, yes. you know, from Wisconsin and all these places and, and Minnesota and all these, you know, all these places. Like I, I pulled the map up today to kind of get a feel because I was getting the registration page stuff done. And it was like, I think we had 40, 44 or 45 states last year. Wow. You know, we had over 10 from Canada that couldn't get come that I gave them tickets for this year because they shut the borders down. Right. You know, they could not come. Then there were some people like that. Um, there was some, you know, people that their family had died and all these things. That's like, man, you got a ticket next year. It's not a big deal. But I think, I think the biggest thing that was hard for me was I thought that it would be not easy because I set up classes. The nice thing is like ads, you know, or the logos. If I do that stuff anyways, so I don't have to sub that out. That's made that easy. I'm pretty savvy with computer stuff, but it's like, man, like, like one person wants to change the ticket to somebody else. They email me and say, Hey, you know, because of COVID thing, we didn't do refunds because it's just firemen can be kind of flaky anyways. Right. Like just in nature. hundred percent. And like period. So. My that's how is, I, that's how I got my ticket. In fact, with someone that couldn't make it and, yeah, and you made I mean, it happen. And I, yeah, and I know I know firemen are gonna have stuff come up, but to me, you've got a big enough network out there. Find somebody that wants to take your spot. Right. Like if you, I want people that want to go. The whole name came up. I was talking. I think to my wife. I said, you know, I want at this show guys that are into the job. That's what I want. 
I don't want guys that are going for promotion. I don't want guys that are going for this. I don't want, I want guys that are into the job. They're going to go She's like, well, call it into the job then. Perfect. Like we're there. Great. You know, and, and that's what I wanted though. I wanted to be around guys that were like-minded that, you know, maybe get made fun of at their department or maybe get treated crappy by their crew because they're going and doing other things right on. and let them realize there's other people in the job like that. Like maybe not at your department. Like I taught a lot, you know, because and I got to go meet the, you know, top one to two percent of the guys in the job, like right. at their department. My dad said, Well, you know, you really like that department, but you know, you're just going with the best guys that wanted to go. Well, that's great. Like that's who I want to be around anyways. Right. right. You know, so we we do that and the teaching explication thing just gave me that. And I just I feel like that happened. Cause I saw guys coming from urban cities that I've never seen at a show. Not an individual. But I've never seen a guy from that department anywhere at any show in the last 10 years, you know, and, and to me, that said something. When right. You've got guys that have 25 plus years on coming from urban cities like that says something to me about the lineup, the instructors. And that's why that it goes so big into like picking them. Right on. Picking these instructors, and it, like and it, it paid off, man. Tough. The amount of effort definitely paid off. The uh, and, and I will say this, man. You you have a gift for uh, I don't want to use the wrong term, branding. Like like the 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 end of the job is beautifully done, man. It is beautiful. Uh, the well, train more, it. I, dude. It 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 resonates. So uh, it has a good image. If because well, that stuff I, that stuff matters. I mean, it does. People yeah. can say it doesn't, but it matters, man. Um, beautiful. Okay. It all came from nothing. Like the train more bitch left. You know, it all came from nothing just because we were talking about it one day and I'm like, uh, it was me and Troy Webster were talking about some logo stuff for my, my tactical advantage training stuff. And I said, you know, we I kind of came up and we're talking about things. I said, man, you know, I don't remember how we were having the conversation, but it's like, man, if, like firemen bitch about everything. It's a, it's a, like, it's a normal thing. Universal. Like the department gives you a pair of leather boots, you know, that were 400 bucks, but we wanted the ones that were 470. We wanted these ones. And these, you know, it's always something. I, I don't think it's meant that way. I think it's just like a cultural thing sometimes. I said, man, if guys would just, you know, train as much as they're bitch about stuff, we'd be in good shape. And he's like, well, yeah. And we started talking about it. And then it just kind of spiraled into something over the years, something <laughs> else. You know, it's but awesome. The TMBO is kind of awesome. A, yeah. And it's just kind of a knuckles thing that most of the Chiefs don't really know what it is. So, you know, it's you can kind of be a little edgy and have it, have it on the underside of your helmet. I'm not a big sticker guy. I don't wear stickers. Um, I'm just not, I'm not a big sticker guy, but it was just kind of that message and let people know, you know, that there's other people out. It's okay to be into the job. You know, it, it's there's other people out there. Like let's come recharge the batteries. Let, let's just get guys together and just have a ball. And for one minute, like, it doesn't matter where you're from. Like that, it is, it's like, Oh, well, you know, it's urban instructors and this and that. And that's the big thing with the speaking. We don't really do, we do steps that's applicable when I talk to the instructors about what they're going to speak on, I want what they're passionate about, not necessarily what's going to be popular, but they're passionate about and not like leader. It's like stuff that's applicable to everybody at all ranks. So it could be a form of fire attack. It could be this, it could be this, it could be like search or something else, but something that is applicable to everybody, Right on. not just <clears throat> chiefs officers or not just, you know, urban city guys or not just, you know, maybe they don't have a truck company at their department. And I came from that. We weren't like, dedicated trucks early on in my career i mean my first my first fire early on um was a double fatal uh like two months on the job with firemen trapped like it was a nightmare on a two-man engine company like i understand limited staffing and heavy rescues we're three man still in florida i was three man that's why i can go it's hard for a rescue company that's got nine guys to go teach you know a volunteer department education it's not for me because I've done it with three for a long time, you know, that, that, that limited manpower. I enjoy that. Um, but it's hard when you got a bunch of like to bump down to a little to no people. Um, but I, I, I want the most work for me possible. My captain will tell you, and we laugh about that is, you know, I'd like to staff up a lot higher, but as long as it doesn't take my workload or my search load <laughs> away, right. you know? it's like, I got to drive the rescue today. I'm outside. Vent. No, you oh. know, it sucks. I love it. Dude, I'm excited for this next one because I love to know what book or books, and, and I know you're a reader, so I really get excited yeah. when I'm talking to a reader. What yeah. book or books, and I know Wild at Heart, you've already mentioned it. Yeah, so that's, big one. Uh, but book or books you think firefighters should be reading? Because I love, yeah, go ahead. Oh, man, there is so many. 
There, I mean, there is so many. And, and I, I like to read, like, for example, I love um, Last Man Out. I'm like a rescue-minded guy. Like, my dad was in that for a long time. I've just been, like, rescue company-minded for a majority of my career. Last Man Out, um, you know, the story of Rescue 2 and FDNY. Like, I like fun books to read because all those situations that they're in in that book, like, you could be in you know, yeah, it's 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 not fictional, it's real, but it's not really a learning book. But it's like, oh man, if I had a fireman trapped under an I beam like they did on that, like like you know what I mean? Sure. That's just how my mind is. I, I I go, well, if I had that, or if I had that, or I mean, I've got I can so I got hundreds of books. I mean, just like I like the the truck company off books, I like special off books. I like I like everything. <laughs> For me. They, like easy, easy reading is is fun books like Last Man Out, um, you know, or Engine Company eighty two. All these kind of older books. I like a lot of the really old books. Uh, Ghetto Fireman, Busy as Hell, the Lost great you. one. Um, Rescue Men, The Brave, uh, The Rescue Company, uh, Twenty Thousand Alarms, Busy as Hell. Like I've got yeah, yes. actually, actually I've got one. Hang on just a second. Okay. I'm holding. He's going to his bookcase. Uh oh. This Christopher Brennan book. I just saw. Hold on. Hold on. Repeat yourself. I lost your voice. Can you hear me still? He's coming back. Come keep talking. Can you hear me? Can you okay, hear me? Can you're you hear back. Me? You're back. All right. Combat position. Achievement firefighter readiness. The beautiful. Um, Christopher Dude. Brennan. Very good book. Yes. And the crazy part. Is I have I just looked over and saw this. I have crews that worked with me over the years that I had read it. Nice. Different guys in what year they read it from August 2011 all the way to October 2016. I had crew members that were that were working under me um, read this book. So I just looked over and I hadn't seen it in a while. Very very good. No book. no Brennan yeah Brennan dude I yeah I have a whole class that is based classic. On- Columbia Firefighters Project. Beautiful. Alaska. It's a very, very hard book to get. From and it, I mean, like old, old, and it just kind of goes into the historic part. Um, it's an '85 book out of DC. It's a really cool book if you could find it, which you probably can't, and you're not getting mine. Right, right. That'll be <laughs> part of yeah. the raffle. That'll be part of the raffle. Yeah, oh, Isaac's yeah. going to give yeah. away some of his books at the raffle <laughs> hey, this year. There we go. There we go. But I'm, I'm a reader, man. I like I like books a lot. My wife is a reader. Um, not that it makes me any smarter, but I feel like I can put myself in some of those positions um, in those books, which is why, you know, I guess people read romance novels and stuff like that. Sure. But, <laughs> Dude, I'm a huge reader, so I just love yeah. hearing what other people yeah. what other people are reading. I yeah. love it. There's love so it. many books out there that it's not even funny. I can't even begin to begin to get into books, but those are just some of them. And I just looked over. It's crazy. I just looked over and saw that the combat position. Um, very good book. Very, Solid. very good book. No, uh, fire service warrior. I, yeah, absolutely. Yep. 100%. Very, right? very good. Love. Um, so we have a thing we do on, on the scrap. It's called the five questions for firefighters and brand yep. new for 2022. We are doing the next five questions for firefighters. Only one person has answered these questions before, and it's the legend Lieutenant Ray McCormick. And so you are the second person who's ever gotten these questions. So, Isaac Frazier, are you ready for the next five questions for firefighters? Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) Yeah. Absolutely. I'm ready. All right, here we go. Question one. What single characteristic makes the difference between a run-of-the-mill firefighter and the top-tier, go-to, badass firefighter? Oh, just challenging the norm. Getting out there and challenging the norm of whatever your department is. Um, just, just, it's okay to be different. And I'm saying be, be humble about it. But look in the mirror and just challenge the norm. If, if you look at something like when it comes to extrication, we got really good at it because we broke down, went by what we were taught and what the books were doing. And we kind of restarted everything from scratch. It just kind of went, and that's kind of how I started teaching it a bunch. But we looked in the mirror and said, maybe, you know, 45 minutes on a rear underride with a tractor trailer is not good enough. You know, where everybody said, well, you know, that we're, we're doing more than any other in the country. The last one that I left, 
um, when I left St. John's, two shifts before I left, we did 14 and 85 from arrival with a full lift, uh, winch out from under, catch the suspension, side out, dash, everything was under under 15 minutes. Wow. So big difference, yes. So so don't just go on the norm of say, hey, you know, this is how we do it and this. You're going to get some kickback, but once stuff started to play, it took me 15 years to get it to play like that. But that 15-year process, I, I kind of challenged, challenged what was out there respectfully challenge the norm don't go tell your officer that you know more than he does or be a mess but respectfully do the research and challenge the norm so respectfully challenge the way you've always done it yes that that, that classic fa- phrase absolutely love it man beautiful beautiful answer number two if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice as a rookie and you've got the advantage of doing this multiple times but yeah, I do. what would it be Cherish the moment. Cherish the moment and cherish it with every crew you have. You're going to learn a lot from a bad officer. I've learned as much from bad officers as, I've, as I have from good. Don't complain about it. You're on borrowed time. You're not going to be with that person forever. Um, I've got in my mind convinced that I'm going to be with my same crew and captain for the rest of his career and mine <laughs> because I don't want to promote. But um, I've seen behind the curtain. I've seen the wizard, as I tell people. <laughs> like, I, I like to do, but my thing is, is a rookie chair, like even your mopping, your cleaning toilets, all those things, just cherish it. Your, your career will go so much faster to think that I've been doing it 18 years in my mind is insane. Like absolutely insane. Um, so just cherish every, every second and learn as much as you can from every person, whether it's the jerk, watch what he does, um, or, or a bad officer, good officer, because as you're watching those people, you're building your report of what you're going to be. You know, when you see that, that say the heavy radio talking, blah, 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 blah. Nobody else can get out and just talking, talking, talking. In that mindset, you're realizing, I don't want to be a, a heavy radio talker. Precisely to the point. And guys will say, you don't really talk on the radio much. I talk if I need to. And if I do talk, you know that I'm saying something that I feel is very important. Um, but just little stuff like that, just, just mm. take it all in. Please, beautiful. Hey, I'm gonna say I like to timestamp that. I, I got the sound bite for the for the episode, so that's a beautiful answer. 100 <laughs> percent max points on that answer. Uh, number three, <laughs> what is your favorite training drill? Oh, mine is the my like my favorite thing because I still love extrication a lot, and I teach that the most because that's that's my volume or that that's what I have the most volume in. Um, speed drills. I love speed drills with exhaustion. I like speed drills to where we're really being challenged. And, and you have to learn. I always tell people it's learn, train on it, and then you do speed. Because mm. a lot of departments, they test. People don't want to be tested. Especially if they, I'm all for being tested if I've learned and I've trained on it and, and I've got the speed down. And now I want it for the challenging part. I want to be challenged. I right. love being tested. Hey, we're going to do fire attack drills in your search. Great. You know, we found the sixth victim. They're out fastest time. Yes. Like, I, I like that. Um, but speed drills, like with extrication, we'll even do it in the, in the full two-day class to where they've never done a side out in, in a no relief dash before. Okay, here, we're doing this. We're doing this. We're doing this. We're doing this. We teach them. We, we let them see all these things of why it's happening. And then we add a little bit of speed. And then we add the exhaustion, the part that will really happen. So on every call, your heart rate's going to be at that. I don't care. I've been cutting cars for a long time, in my mind, a lot of volume. And your heart rate's still going to rise. The one we just had a double with, that's the, probably the first time I've ever done an extrication in a car while fire's coming up through the floor pan, you know, hitting my tools, and I'm on an air pad with no visibility. I, I don't know that I can remember back that I've done that. And we had them out in, I think, 807 from arrival, getting tools off everything, which I felt like was good. But I have an officer to let me do what I need to do. Like he, he trusts me a lot. Um, but in the drills, we'll have we'll teach them, we'll learn, we'll do this. Then we add speed. Well, then we add pressure. So everybody gets around. Love They're it. watching you, which is pressure. And then we'll do you know a couple laps and some burpees. So now you feel like you're going to throw up, which in relation is your third call after midnight. You sure. already worked the house fire. You're exhausted, and you go in there, and now your heart rate's up. And now you start to go back to the well and you start doing the same crap that you always did before. Right. Not what you just said was the best thing. Beautiful. So that learning 
evolution is you learn that the shortcuts don't work. They, they don't work. Like shortcuts do not work. So you go this, 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 this. And then you see like the, the beautiful thing to me is you see somebody that's never done this. And in two days, they do a, a sub five minute, you know, full side out from arrival with a dash, everything in, in like sub four or five minutes. And they're like, I find almost dry heaving because they feel sick because they're right. exhausted because they just did physical exertion. But like the look on that face makes the travel worth it, make everything worth it. It's just like, like they, they understand, they get it. Right. They get it. And to me, it's like a, I don't know, it's kind of a high for me to see them succeed. I want other people to succeed. And a lot of people in modern fire service don't want other people to succeed. I want your show to go as good as mine. I mm -hmm. want, you know, uh, fire builds to do as good as they is, or I want to do as good as Mark Mon Offense thing. I, I want people, I don't understand why we like people in the fire service have to like beat people down. Like I've never competed with extrication guys. I teach something different than they do. There's what 34,000 fire, there's some crazy amount of fire departments we could teach for 500 years and not cover an eighth of them. Like, like <laughs> just don't beat each other down. Just do your thing. You do you, and I'll do me. And, and Corley will do him, and your boy in OKC will do him. Like, like, there's enough like teaching, and there's like there's enough to go around. I just feel like people are missing, missing kind of the heart and uh, heart and soul of it sometimes. Love it, man, dude. A passion is there. Uh, I'm not sure if I got the favorite training drill, but the answer was so good. I'm giving it max points, even though I couldn't even <laughs> pin down. Dude, speed it was drills. great. No, education speed drills. Dude, I love the fact when you said teach them what they're supposed to know and then stress them. Don't don't stress nope. them and try and teach them something because they're not going to learn anything. Dude, I love nope. it. I love it. And they're uh, going to hate training. That, that's nope. the problem. It's not training; it's testing. So oh. that, that's where it, that's where it goes it's wrong. Beautiful man. Um, number four. <laughs> I'm getting fired up. What mistake have you learned the most from in your fire service career? Yeah. What, what mistake have I not learned from? No. I've had my pee pee smacked so many times. I don't, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I think early on for me, it's not really a job, a job related one. Um, I'm a big family guy. And I think one of the mistakes early on that, that you have to learn. Number one is your wife is not a fireman. So like the joking and, and going back and forth and the stuff we said, it, she's not that she had to stress that with me. That was hard early on. And then um, I think one of the mistakes early, early on is you start to forget your family a little bit once this takes off and, and you, you know what I mean? You really start to, to build stuff and do a lot of time. You can get sucked into this time wise. Um, and I think, I don't think it was a mistake because I never got there. Um, you just have to remember your family and you have to remember your own department. That's one thing that, that's hard. You know, you go do all these things, but you, you're leaving your own, your own department. You have to remember your own people. You have to remember where you come from. Mm -hmm. And like St. John's, I always taught there. Um, for a couple of years, I taught, you know, recruit, they changed some stuff, but I, I taught recruit stuff here for extrication um, for our recruits from the class after mine on. Um, you know, the department gives me a lot. I want to give the department a lot as well. But just, I think you have to remember your family, remember where you're come from. And I think that can be a mistake early on to where the fire service is all you have. And it becomes you. Like, right. this isn't me. Like, I love the fire department. I'll tell you a thousand times over that it's my life. But like when I'm wake surfing, you know, in the summer, I don't think about the fire department. Like you've got to have your own, don't let it be your only identity. Cause right. I've seen a lot of guys that have, and they're divorced and they have terrible times and they're just divorced after divorce and they, they don't understand what's going on. And I, I think, you, I think that's a mistake that, that a lot of firemen make early on is that they forget their family. Solid Merlin. And I, and, and that should be a soundbite played at every rookie class, you know, just to kind of set the mind frame, you know, yeah. Hey, I, 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 Will will they be will the young the young studs be able to hear it? Probably not, but no, probably uh, not. <laughs> but it's a great probably set. not. <laughs> but it's a great lesson, man. Uh, beautiful. Uh, final question number five: heavy fire and searchable space. Would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on VES search? 
That's the fastest answer you can get. Uh, probably it wasn't so. even out of your mouth. And, and, and I, I say that I love, I love searching off the line. I love Wichita is big on it. Like we are very, very, one of the most aggressive search departments that I've ever seen in traveling. I've seen a lot um, in our kind of rescues. You can see that mm-hmm. like, and I think the change on it, just the way that things have changed, uh, Chief Bo and a bunch of guys in the, the, the truck academy has changed over the years. Wrestler came up with barter. Like a lot of guys came up when we were, I wasn't here yet. But maybe I don't know, ten years ago or something, they started they started changing the the search kind of culture here a little bit, um, where the outside man will search through the rear, outside man will go to the back, force the rear door, and he'll search solo, you know, 10, 15 feet in because just the experience level they were finding people in the back after fire attack had already been done, like multiple yeah. fatals year after year, and they said, well, what if OB shoots back there fast, force the rear door, now we've got the door controlled. Does a quick sweep, and then they did that, and they were like making six rescues a year, like bang, 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 and and it's a it's a old department, but it's old school and progressive at the same time, Beautiful which is very combo. very yeah. hard to find. But yeah, I love to search. I love I love to search. Um, we just did a best. I got a helmet camera that I don't show. Um, did a best, and I maybe got thirty five seconds before I got steamrolled out. Um, but just I like. I like to search. It just to me, like I love to be on the nozzle too. Right. Like I'm not saying that. Like that's why I love. That's why I love the question because it really does put you in a quandary. But now the hard part is you talk like first new fire attack verse like like two nights ago we show up at the exact same time as engine four shows up rescue one shows up I hop off the back and I go search search in front of the line fire blowing everywhere to me that's a better gig than opening and closing sure. the nozzle me. Um, I, I, I like to search. Right. I don't, and it's there not the like, oh, I have to find people. Like it's the, the, you know, grabs. I've got to make grab that. That I just, to me, everything slows down. It's quiet. You can't see anything. Like it, it reminds me of diving almost. You know, when we dive, it's zero visibility. The black water diving that we do, and it's just like everything slow motion in your mind. Like it's just there, there's a lot. I, I don't know. Like I love fire attack but i like search i feel like i'm more i'm more suited like that's more my thing um to force and search like or best and we're big invested with 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 y'all like big big in it um but i mean my buddy sean hayes he's made multiple rescues like a lot of the guys in my house have made multiple rescues and it just i don't know man like that 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 grab we had last year me and brandon um we ended up not vesting but it was faster to take the window and have me dive out and Brandon throw him up in the window to me um, and get him out. And the guy lived. I met him that night. We went back to check the fire. Craziest things ever happened to me. Wow. You know, and he comes up and he's got a black eye and his face is beat up. And he comes one. I'm like, he's like, are you the one that did it to my captain that was acting at the time or riding over? And he's like, no, it was this guy. And Brandon was back at the house on the pumper. He's like crying and thank you. And like, are you the one that punched me in the face? Because he had a big black eye. Right. And it was Brandon when he grabbed him and he's a strong dude, threw him up. His head came back and hit Brandon's helmet, I think. Okay. And uh, he's like, man, I can't believe like that. But you don't, you don't get that with fire attack. Fire sure. attack is the, another rescue they had. You know, I was on the nozzle. You don't get any, you know, <laughs> they could have done the search without what we did, you know, on the nozzle melted my mask. Like I respect the nozzle. Mask. I respect every position. I respect the truck on the roof. We're a big event department. Like I respect every single position because I've been in all of them at a decent amount of time. But I feel like my suited thing is zero visibility. Get in there fast and do the best that I can um, in search. And I think I think search is tough because I think search takes a lot of experience. I think you have to be in that position a lot um, to really search off the line and get aggressive on search. Right. I feel like that's you have to. It's a it's a mindset. Because that can that can make a turn on you in any second, and we've been been steamrolled out multiple times on some pretty hairy ones. Um, but like where I work in the core of the city, like those guys are they're such good firemen. Like you can you can really push it. If I was going to be trapped in a house fire, anyway, I'd want it to be in the core the core of Wichita, anywhere in the country. That's my personal opinion. Um, 
because they're they're coming for you. And, and fire attack's going to be fast. I mean, they're they're going to do everything they can for you. A solid. That's a that that's a that's a big uh big and and, the, and there I, I gotta also wrap it up the the uh yeah. the five questions because that is his answer search one word answer <laughs> one word answer search. that turned into a very long explanation <laughs> but a beautiful explanation so very well done and there it is the five next five questions for <laughs> firefighters according to Isaac Fraser brother thank you very much and that officially puts one hundred and twenty one scraps in the books uh, the second scrap completed for twenty twenty two. And, and you got to be proud of that, man. Dude, you've, got, you've done a hell of a thing here. You got to be proud of that. I mean, I'm just a talker for the day. You're the one putting this stuff together. I'm so I appreciate you. it. I can't thank you enough. It's a hundred percent the quality of the guests and the quality of what they, their passion. And, and you show that today. Um, if someone wants to get a hold of you and, and more importantly, I want to talk yeah. about into the job. When can we get tickets type deal? Yeah. January 10th registration opens up at eight central. Um, it'll be on into the job fs.com under register ticket, whatever. Is that 0800 or 2000? I'm just, that's 08, 0800. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just making sure 0800 central time. It, it'll open up. And I think like last year, if I remember, like in the first 14 minutes, there was almost 300 tickets gone. Right. So it, it, this, this one word of mouth, it should be really good. Um, but yeah, man, it'll, it'll be, I can guarantee you that it's not. We learned some stuff from this year, just the the first beginner type things um, with it. But it's going to be we're back at the same place again. The price is the exact same. We didn't up the price, anything like that. Um, we did. We could have went to a bigger venue and sold out a bigger venue. But to me, when you get 800 firemen in a place, like to me, that's that's a home run all day. And I, I think that this year's lineup is out of control. Awesome, man. Awesome. I look forward to it, brother. I will be Me there. Too. Me too. I, I will be yeah, there. I know you will be. <laughs> so, uh, provided, provided I, got, I, can I got get a, a ticket. ticket. I got a ticket for you. I got a ticket. All right. All right. I'm, I'm going to try and get on there and get one. But I got one. Hey, I may even try to do the RV thing and turn it into a actual tailgating event. So we'll see. Gosh. They did it last year. <laughs> I know. They were chasing uh, Longhorns and I want to try. By Longhorns I want to try and be a part of that. I may bring an RV up, rent an RV and bring it up there and, and see if we can't uh, get there like was a, three or there four. There was a lot of beer shotgun. <laughs> and uh, there's a guy from Wisconsin. I hadn't shotgun a beer since the summer, and I put a beating on him. So there you go. I, I, I felt bad about it. I was going to cut him some slack, and I had to put a beating on him. There it is. Uh, <laughs> to show that you still got it. Uh, oh, I still got it. Everybody, uh, you can hit firehousevigilance.com. The store is fully stocked after Christmas. Everything's ready to go. So if you want hats, shirts, coins, etc., go for them. I want to read this. This is this is something I got in the mail today. If you follow. And it's a handwritten letter, man. So I wanted people ask me, I don't know if it'll show up, but people ask me all the time, why do I put out a scrap every week? And this is what it says. It says, Mr. Moore, uh, thank you for all this cool swag. This means a lot to me. The challenge coin is my favorite. My favorite scrap is number 100 with Kurt Isaacson. That's a lot of people's love, Kurt. Good so one. number 112 with Kevin Lewis. And he says, uh, when I am older, I want to be a truck guy. Thanks again. Keep up the great scraps. Never stop your fight against complacency. That's Colton Robertson. I, I don't get don't get mad at me if I get. I think he's twelve years old and he plans to be a firefighter and he watches the scrap and he said, "P.S. Number one eighteen was great." So I don't know. I had to look back. And well, see. Send, send me his address and I'll send him some stuff. Send there him it is. And a half. I love it. Okay. Send me his address. I'll send him some stuff and maybe get him off that truck mindset. <laughs> <laughs> get him wise early he'll be the most fought over uh <laughs> recruit uh absolutely yeah. so um brother thank you so much i want to say i got thank colton you. in there next up brian bastinelli he is coming up then timmy gleason uh so january is already like awesome and is loaded for bear uh if you see me out and about get a picture i i mean it man i want to get more pictures i'm terrible at it and 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 isaac touched on it today we need more we got to remember more um, if the, if you think that the scrap brings value to your firefighter life, go to firehousevigilance.com, support it. Uh, I, again, I never want to do ads. I want to keep it completely ad free and supported by firefighters. Uh, I want to shout out to Christopher Crawford, the newest supporter. Thank you very much. Remember first, I want to say thank you, Isaac, uh, for being an awesome guest. No problem, man. I had a ball. Mutts don't scrap. I hope the tone stays silent unless it's burning. Everybody stay safe out there.